Welcome. Um, I'm happy to uh, introduce Brooke Holmes uh, once again for the third installment in her lecture series, The Tissue of the World, Sympathy in Greco-Roman Antiquity. Tonight's lecture is entitled The Interconnected Microcosm. Um, I hope you will, uh, you'll all be able to join us for the reception after the lecture. But for now, um, please join me in welcoming Brooke once again. Well, it's a pleasure to be back here today. And as you can see, we started off very grand, and then we moved to the kind of middle level, and now we're going inside the organism today. Um, so it's a little body world, uh, as you can see from my, my first slide. So in the 61st section of the monadology, Leibniz programmatically sums up his doctrine of pre-established harmony, a doctrine that Christian Mercer has recently called universal sympathetic harmony pushed to its limits. The whole is a plenum and therefore all matter is interconnected. Universal intercommunication means that everybody is sensitive to everything in the universe so that, Leibniz writes, someone who saw everything could read in each thing what happens everywhere, even what has happened and what will come to be, noticing in what is nearest at hand what is furthest away, be it in time or in space. To drive home this point, Leibniz gives us a brief phrase from the Hippocratic Treatise on nutriment, sumpnoia, panta, everything, breathes together. The phrase clearly appealed to Leibniz. He included it in his nouveau essay sur l'entendement in a similar context, and he again jotted it down in a series of notes on physics from 1672, soon after his arrival in Paris at a formative moment in his career. That Leibniz turned to Hippocrates for confirmation of his claim is not surprising. His writings are replete with references to the ancients, so Plato and Aristotle above all, but also Democritus and Galen. Now these references function at least in part as strategic moves in Leibniz's complex negotiation of the battlefield where the ancients met the moderns in 17th century philosophy. But his citation of Hippocrates also points to a more complex transhistorical conspiracy. The passage from On Nutriment, which is the first passage on your handout, locates co-breathing at the level of the microcosmic body, and more specifically at the level of a body that also flows together and suffers together. Leibniz certainly accepted the microcosmic model of co-breathing, but in his view, the scope of the passage is macrocosmic. If the shift in scale comes easily to him, it's because his metaphysics are thoroughly permeated with biological thinking. His fundamental ontology, as Justin Smith has written, consists exclusively of living creatures, and his fundamental physics is a physics of organic bodies endowed with living force. So Leibniz's organic cosmology will sound familiar. As we saw two weeks ago, Stoic metaphysics is permeated by biological thinking. Stoic cosmobiology rigorously elaborates the cosmic animal of Plato's Timaeus with help from Aristotelian life science to produce a strikingly new model of the world. The cosmo-organic model is spectacularly supported, if in part indirectly, by the phenomenon of sympathy. Now, if we take Leibniz at his word, uh, this mic microcosmic body and sympathy goes back to Hippocrates. And indeed, it's not only Leibniz who makes Hippocrates the father of the sympathetic body. Galen, as we saw last week, uses the passage from On Nutriment to make Hippoc Hippocrates the father of a tradition of natural philosophy committed to nature with a capital N and a body knit together by sympathy. He cites the passage from On Nutriment not once but three times in the treatise on the natural faculties alone, and he cites it again and again throughout his corpus, always with an eye to defending a nature that is mindful and unified. Now, in On the Method of Healing, Galen acknowledges the strong stoic connotations of this kind of sympathy, but he also insists there, and this is number two on your handout, that the followers of Chrysippus approve all of Hippocrates' doctrines about nature, including what Hippocrates says about all the parts of the body being in sympathy. So Hippocrates is the original stoic. 
Now, from the perspective of modern scholarship, Galen has it backwards. It's Hippocrates, or at least the Hippocrates of on Nutriment, who gets sympathy from the Stoics. Now, I'm afraid I don't mean this in a radical reception sense, in the sense of Virgil influencing Homer, but in a more prosaic sense. Simply put, the majority of historians are loath to date on Nutriment any later than the third century BCE, and this is mostly because, although not only because, of this very stoic sounding language of sympnoia and sympatheia. The sympathy that travels under the name of Hippocrates from Galen to Leibniz then is in an important sense stoic. But in defending the letter of the philological law, we should not lose sight of a basic insight that the afterlife of Hippocratic sympathy, uh, that the afterlife of Hippocratic sympathy affords us, which is simply this. What I have been calling solo sympathy is intimately bound to the conceptualization of relations within an organic body. And the persistent attachment of the name of Hippocrates to a doctrine of sympathy confirms this. So I turn to microcosmic sympathy in my lecture today not because I want to uncover the origins of sympathy and certainly not because I'm interested in somehow crediting them to Hippocrates. Rather, I undertake an inquiry into the microcosm because mapping the dynamics of sympathy within the organic body is necessary to understanding sympathy more generally as a conceptual habit. Now, I've been adopting this term, conceptual habit, in part to capture the way sympathy takes shape across a number of different authors, philosophical schools, intellectual traditions, and so on. I've been arguing that widening our lens will help us appreciate the plenitude within the figure of sympathy that exceeds the boundaries of a concept in any kind of linear genealogy. And I've also been using the language of conceptual habit in order to get at the dynamism of sympathy, the way that it has of driving thought around, along different vectors. So we can speak of these vectors loosely in terms of a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. So by vertical axis, I mean to emphasize an overarching mind or a mind-like power that, especially in Stoicism, organizes the dispersed parts of the cosmos into a unified, coherent, interconnected whole. At the same time, it organizes the parts into independent wholes and organizes the relations of, in, of individual natures with one another. The horizontal axis, by contrast, travels along the plane of parts, threading through the differential distribution of mind throughout many natures. The world from this perspective is flat. Each part expresses the whole. So in the first lecture, I used these axes to capture the way in which, through sympathy, we at once scale up to God and down to mollusks. The cosmic sympathy developed above all by the Stoics is a hybrid of metaphysics and natural history. And more subtly, the flattening of the world turns on a common property of all bodies, the capacity to be affected. In the context of sympathy, affectability reads as magnified vulnerability, the exposure of all parts to the affects of one another, but it also reads as dynamic enmeshment compatible with the perpetuation of life. By contrast, the verticality of the world emphasizes the ranking of a scala naturae, and it points to the subordination of all lives to a net of predetermined causes. Now, last week, I took up these axes, the vertical and the horizontal, from the perspective of what I've been calling big N nature and little n natures, multiplicity of natures, lowercase and plural. And this entailed moving from sympathy singular and unified to the manifold sympathies and antipathies that organize relations between natures. I argue that by focusing on the relation between natures, sympathy and antipathy encourage the conceptualization of a trans-individual top-down agency or mind, what many ancient authors will call nature. The push to posit the agency of capital N nature is driven too by the apparent limitations of non-human minds to forge the relations they need to survive as living organisms, whether these relationships are seen as quasi-social or as mapped onto the navigation of benefit and harm. But we saw that the upward attraction of nature, capital N, is countered by the pull of individual natures through which a master universal mind becomes embodied and ensouled in differentially constituted beings. So how can we account for what I call the fold between nature and the mindfulness of specific natures? I suggested that the Stoic concept of oikiosis offers one approach to this question. Galen, in trying to grasp the structures whereby a nature, and especially a vegetal nature, takes on the work of living, offers another approach. 
In On the Natural Faculties, the labor of organic life in human beings is carried out via the natural faculties. These faculties act in part by discriminating according to sympathies and antipathies, that is, by making qualitative distinctions in matter. Now, the very fact that sympathy cuts across all nature makes it a good strategy for avoiding the imputation of mind or reasoning to the wrong kinds of organisms. And yet, it's precisely sympathy's unfettered explanatory power that can make it feel inadequate to account for the fine-grained negotiations between a living organism and its environment. By attributing perception to plants, Galen ended up carving out a little space for the mindfulness of an individual plant nature in its pursuit of life. We ended up then with the figure of perception qua discrimination of quality as a controversial common denominator of living things. The passive principle of affectability is here complicated by the active work of participating in a cross-species community for vital ends. The resulting instability can be gauged in the difficulty of assigning the work of living either to nature that is singular or to the individual nature that by definition is embedded in an environment of many natures. So today I want to see how these different facets of sympathy come into play through the workings of sympathy within an individual human being. Now in following sympathy through medicine and philosophical psychology, what will become immediately evident is the downside of interconnectivity, what I've spoken of as the magnification of vulnerability. The technical term sympathia in medicine, for example, almost always speaks of the communication of pain or disease from one part of the body to another part of the body. And the sympathy between body and soul, as we've already seen in Stoicism, more often than not, is the occasion for shared suffering. Yet by the Hellenistic period, sympathy is also understood in terms of a body whose parts work as a unity, as we see in On Nutriment. And it informs concepts of perception as an activity that is common to body and soul. So then we might ask, what will constitute the common ground of body and soul? How are affections trafficked from one part of the body to another? And where does the labor of the vegetal body meet the workings of the conscious and the rational mind in a human nature? In the last part of the paper, I'll take up these questions by returning to the corpus of Galen. First, though, I want to take a look at two different models of proto-sympathy in the Hippocratics before thinking about how sympathy emerges as a name to describe the relation of two particular parts of a human being, namely body and soul. So in one sense, most of the diseases in the 5th and 4th century Hippocratic texts are sympathetic. One of the fundamental tenets of humoral pathology is that disease rarely stays in one place. So the same vessels that allow life-giving fluid and air to move throughout the body also allow pathological matter to move. So the principle is laid out very succinctly in the opening pages of a treatise called On Places in a Human Being. Each part of the body, when it falls ill, produces disease in another part. Now the basic idea here has to do with overflow and excess. So if the stomach can't digest all its food, for example, it sends its excess fluids to the head. The laws of attraction here are familiar from other Hippocratic treatises, so fluids will move into hollow or dry parts of the body through vessels that communicate and flow into one another. But the author of On Places in a Human Being is unusually self-conscious about the implications of his model for a concept of the interconnected and unified body. In chapter 9, for example, he speaks of the body as communicating with itself. So tosoma koinononeon auto heato, with itself. Um, the treatise, in fact, begins with the evocative and potent image of the circle. This is uh, number 3 on your handout in terms that recall a famous fragment of Heraclitus. Now, the author has another more opaque and more idiosyncratic way of thinking about communication within the unified body. So in the first chapter, he observes the following. It's number four in the handout. The body is itself identical to itself and composed of the same things, although not in uniform disposition, both in its small parts and in its large parts, those below and those above. And if someone should take the smallest part of the body and cause it harm, the whole body will feel the damage of whatever sort it is, for the reason that the smallest part of the body has all the things that the greatest part has. 
Whatever the smallest part experiences, it passes it on to its related part, each to which is related to it, whether it is something good or bad. And the body, on account of these things, feels pain and pleasure from the smallest constituent, because in the smallest part, all the parts are present, and these communicate with the parts that are their own and inform them of everything. Now, in this passage, the logistics of the communication are obscure. And as I said, it's a quite unusual passage from the Hippocratic Corpus. But the language confirms the author's commitment to the idea that the body is not an agglomeration of parts, but rather a well-integrated whole. So what we have in On Places in a Human Being, then, are two versions of the body as a whole. On the first model, disease arises in one part and gets communicated to another via vessels, or a, a network of vessels, or one vessel. The parts, in other words, are materially conjoined in a way that suggests the ideal figure of the circle. On the second model, the migration of an affection, a pathos, is seen in terms of the relatedness, the homo ethnie, that joins the smallest parts of the body to one another. The context here is not disease or a humoral disease as much as it is pleasure and pain, that is, affections that are experienced by the whole body. And the parts, moreover, are not macro, but mostly micro, something like the building blocks of the body. They participate in a community, literally in an ethnos, where each member announces pain and pleasure to the others. Now, this idea of the body as an ethnos is a powerful one, and it's also a very unusual one. The only other occurrence of the word in the corpus, or occurrences, um, refer to a group of people living in an organized society under similar climactic and environmental conditions, so mostly in air, uh, on airs, waters, places. And the related word homo ethnie is also rare, showing up in just one other place in the corpus. Um, in one of the gynecological treatises, a uterine affection results in the swelling of the breasts according to their homo ethnie. Now, another text, Epidemics 2, which is number five on the handout, speaks of the koinonia, the association or the partnership or the relationship of chest, breast, genitals, and voice. The gynecological examples thus give further evidence for this idea of communication on the basis of something like kinship. And we can distinguish that model from a model based on a mechanics of attraction and fluid dynamics where you have vessels joining parts together. At the same time, the association of the breast and the uterus takes us back to the part-to-part -part relationship that we saw in that first model, away from the part-to-whole relationship in the example of pain. So in the Hippocratic corpus, the movement of affections or pain from one part to another is already producing a conceptualization of the body as an interconnected whole. Now, what we find in later medical and philosophical writing is that arguments on behalf of that whole will start to be explicitly secured through the idea of sympathia. Indeed, one of the models that I've just sketched may sound familiar to you. Two weeks ago, we saw that one of the ways that the Stoics prove sympathy is by pointing to the fact that when the finger is cut, the whole body experiences the pain. That Stoic paradigm of sympathy mapped beautifully onto the Hippocratic author's account of pain and pleasure as a communication between the parts and the whole. Yet you'll notice that there's an important difference here as well. In the Stoics, pain is communicated from part to whole because of the total distribution of soul throughout the body. In the same way, pain is communicated to the soul, the hegemonicon via pneuma. By contrast, the shared ethnicity among the parts in the Hippocratic text are sufficient for their communication with one another. So that is, the notion of the whole here is in no way secured by the idea of a soul, nor does the phenomenon of pain entail two parts in particular, body and soul. There's in fact only one classical era Hippocratic text where human nature is truly conceived of as a unity between body and soul, namely the text on regimen. And that text espouses a strong sense of psychosomatic unity, but that author is not especially interested in the communication of, of affections from body to soul. Nor, unsurprisingly, does he use the language of sympathy, which we don't find in that early period. On regimen, then, despite its apparent dualism, will end up demonstrating the unproblematic holism, or the coordination of many parts into a single whole, that we see in the Hippocratics. The idea, though, that the, the human being could be split into two parts, body and soul, was gaining ground in the later 5th and early 4th century. 
And together with that split comes a question that has haunted the Western philosophical tradition ever since, namely how to stitch those two halves back together. I want to suggest that one reason the concept of sympathy starts to gain traction in the fourth century is precisely because it enables the strategy of rejoining soma and psyche, a strategy based on mutual affectability. Now, in order to grasp the dynamics of psychophysical sympathy, we need to turn first to the nebulous class of states, functions, processes, and experiences that get referred to as common to body and soul. So this phrase, common to body and soul, shows up as far as we can tell for the first time in Plato's Philebus. So Socrates is there describing aesthesis, sensation, or perception as a movement, or more specifically as a shock, a seismos, that's both common to body and soul and particular to each, idion to kaikoinon hekatero. The shock begins in the body, and it may in fact stay there if it's too weak to cross the threshold into the soul. It becomes a sensation proper only when we find, quote, the soul and the body coming together in one common affection uh, and heni pathé and being moved in common. Sensation, then, in the Philebus is, is an event that affirms the boundary between body and soul while also allowing for some kind of communication between them in the form of a tremor. The experience of sensation remains the common ground of soma and psyche in Aristotle. And in fact, Aristotle considers a number of states common to body and soul precisely because they both participate in sensation. These include being awake, pleasure, and pain, and desire. But Aristotle has a rather different take on sensation than Plato. In the Philebus, Plato represents sensation in vaguely pathological terms as a shock from body to soul. By contrast, as Stephen Menes recently emphasized, Aristotle sees sensation, at least by the time of the Dianima, as proper to the soul. So in the Dianima, he represents sensation less as a necessary but an unsettling disturbance, as we see in the Philebus, and more as an activity that's natural to ensouled animals. And yet even as he affirms the partnership, the koinonia, between the body and the soul in sensation, he isn't entirely clear on how affections get trafficked between them, or even on whether the soul suffers affections at all. He seems loath, at least in the Dianima, to talk about the body causing affections in the soul or vice versa. So he prefers the language of simultaneity and coordination. And so this is number six on your handout where you can see this language of hama pasche. In Aristotle's then, we end up with a rather complex situation. By making the concept of common to body and soul central to his account of the animal as a psychophysical unity, Aristotle helps endow that concept with philosophical traction. But the idea of the body and the soul suffering together also entail difficulties for him. So if he doesn't use the language of sympathia or sympathien, we shouldn't be too surprised. So for one thing, both the noun and the verb are not particularly common in the fourth century. But I think also there's the problem that it may have been the case that for Aristotle, the language of pathe doesn't always sufficiently differentiate between the kind of thing that happens to a body and a psychic state or function. So it's interesting here to look at one of the very few instances where Aristotle does use the verb sympaschein from the prior analytics. So he's talking there about making judgments about character from uh, appearance. And such judgments are possible, he says, if you grant that body and soul change together, hama metabolane, in all natural affections such as anger and desire, and he concludes that body and soul suffer together. So the language here is, is sympaschein. So what matters in this instance is the coordination. It's the relation itself, not the nature of the relationship. And in later peripatetic texts, we can see that when it's the relation that's at stake, sympathy offers itself as a standard, we might even say a technical word. So the founding maxim of the pseudo-Aristotelian physiog uh, physiognomy, which is number seven on your handout, is that mental dispositions follow bodies and are not unaffected in themselves by the movement of the body. Well, the body in turn is sympathetic with, with, uh, or sympathetic with the affections of the soul. And similarly, in the pseudo-Aristotelian problemata, which is number eight on your handout, sympathy is again used to describe the relation of the body and soul. 
But when Aristotle himself is puzzling over just how the body and the soul are implicated in one another, as in the Dianima, difference is as important as coordination, above all in the realm of acting and being acted on. And this may account in part for why he does not push the language of sympathy. Now this situation will change dramatically in the Hellenistic period. In both Epicurean and Stoic psychology, sympathy comes to function as an important technical term grounded in the very premise that is resisted by Aristotle, namely the soul can be affected by a body and can affect it in turn because it too is a body. Indeed, Christoph Rapp has argued that the emphasis on causal interaction among bodies, which is captured by Hellenistic sympathy, is a response to Aristotle's vagueness about how body and soul interact. So you may recall a Stoic argument from last week where sympathy was deployed to prove that the soul is a body, and I've repeated it on, on number nine. No incorporeal suffers together with a body, and no body with an incorporeal, but the soul suffers together with the body, and the body with the soul. Therefore, the soul is a body. In other words, affections travel in both directions across a common ground of corporeality. More, simp more specifically, the pneuma diffused throughout the body functions as a web that communicates impacts to the body to the ruling part, the hegemonicon, and the soul in turn communicates affections to the body. So in this passage that I've just cited, the point seems to be less about the psychophysical unity of the organism. But then again, we might, we might say that it's only by establishing the materiality of the soul that the pain of the finger can, in fact, affect the whole. So the two concepts and the new, two arguments are interrelated. So we're returning here again to the familiar doubleness of sympathy. On the one hand, it exaggerates the organism's openness to the outside, and openness is located in both the body's receptivity to the world and a receptivity of the soul to the body, the soul to the body's tremors. It's precisely this openness that Aristotle seems to want to protect against um, in, in the De Anima. The Stoics, too, introduce a checkpoint between affections and the decisions that are taken by a rational, that is, a human mind in their moral psychology, with what they call the mind's assent to impressions. On the other hand, though, the receptivity of soul to body and vice versa enables communication through which the two parts are enmeshed in one another in such a way as to create the unity of a living whole. The total mixture of body and soul for the Stoics from this perspective can be seen to offer a version of the ethnos that binds the different parts to one another in the Hippocratic text on the places in a human being. And we can see this bridging role of psychophysical sympathy in the Epicureans too. In Epicureanism, everything that isn't void is body and the soul is no exception. Yet the soul also has particular qualities that enable it to act on the body and to be acted on. In the letter to Herodotus, Epicurus describes the psuche as a body, a soma of fine particles distributed throughout the aggregate, the athroisma, that is the atomic compound of the whole. There is, however, another element of the soul, still finer than the others, that precisely because of its fineness is sympathetic with the rest of the whole. So one area where sympathy is especially important is, as we have come to expect, that of sensation. At the same time, we're told that the psuche also gives sensation to the aggregate on account of, quote, its proximity to and its sympathy with it. Lucretius will drive the intimacy of soul and body home in book three of the Dururum Natura. He argues there that the mind and the soul, that is the anima and the animus, must be corporeal if they're to act on the body, that is to, for example, to initiate movement. And at the same time, the mind is affected when the body is struck or damaged. So here again, sympathy, and here um, Lucretius uses the language of consensus or consentire, doesn't just open up the soul to the affectability of the flesh, but it will also create the conditions for the soul to instrumentalize the body for its own ends. So for example, sensation or movement. So in the Hellenistic period, we see that sympathy starts to emerge as a privileged way for thinking about the ground common to body and soul understood as two halves of an organic compound. Whether or not there's a direct engagement with Aristotle, sympathy in both Stoicism and Epicureanism seems to entail a commitment to the corporeality of both the parts that are implicated in the suffering. By making corporeality the shared ground of body and soul, the Stoics and the Epicureans paved the way not just for sympathy in the strict sense of co-affection, but also for the mutual implication of body and soul in sensation and movement. So in some sense, then, we could say that sympathy names the conditions both for sustaining life, 
and for its disruption and sometimes, in fact, its dissolution. Yet the talk of corporeality as shared ground, as Koinonia remains, it must be said, rather vague. It's true that both the Stoics and the Epicureans have a way of explaining the diffusion of soul through body that can help explain why the blow to one part will affect the whole. But soul on these models is an ephemeral, unseen body, invisibly enmeshed in the density of the flesh. If we turn now to medical writing after the fourth and especially the third century BCE, we find considerably more attention to the organic structures through which vital stuffs move in the body, body making possible sensation of movement, but also physiological processes. Galen, in particular, is fascinated by the underlying networks that make sympathy possible, and he sought to map them through systematic dissection. But the more that the architecture of the networked organism materializes out of air and into the flesh and sinew of the body, the harder we'll see it can be to incorporate the soul into the unified organism. So the problem here won't be whether soul and body affect each other. The question is how. Indeed, the threat of dissociation in the realm of affectability will also be restaged in Galen by a concern about how to join together the life of the vegetal body and the life of the rational mind. But before mapping that dilemma, I want to look first at the fate of sympathetic affections in post-classical medical writing. So the vast body of medical writing between the Hippocratic corpus and Galen is lost to us. Nevertheless, it's clear that at some point in the Hellenistic or the early imperial period, sympathia enters the clinical terminology of the learned medical tradition. So in Serenus of Ephesus' gynecology, for example, which was probably written sometime in the second century, we read that the uterus acts sympathetically pro sympathion on the stomach. And Serenus also recasts the Hippocratic partnership, remember the koinonia, the homoethnia, between the uterus and the breasts as a kind of natural sympathy, tis physicae sympathia. Serenus will be followed here by Galen, who in fact projects the language of sympathy back onto his Hippocratic source text in his commentaries. So in Galen's commentary on the passage from Epidemics 2 about chest, breast, gen uh, breast genitals, and voice, um, his commentary is preserved only in Arabic. But we can see in the Arabic translation the use of the term musharaka, in which we can detect Galen's notion of sympathia. So Galen doesn't just use the language of sympathy in talking about the Hippocratic texts. What's especially interesting is how eager and even anxious he is to give an account of why sympathy in this case is possible. So immediately after having introduced the community of parts, he hastens to explain the reason for the connection between them. And that reason has everything to do with the underlying network of veins, especially between the breast and the uterus. Um, and this is passage 10 on your handout. Um, which Galen eventually spells out with great decisiveness. Indeed, one of the reasons that Galen is so committed to the Hippocratic authorship of Epidemics II, despite the text's many infelicities, which would make it not worthy of the divine Hippocrates under normal circumstances, so one of the reasons he's committed to it is that it offers one of the most detailed accounts of vascular anatomy in the Hippocratic corpus. The problem with this is that the Hippocratic author does not actually refer to the partnership of chest, breast, genitals, and voice in terms of an anatomical grid. And more problematic still, he fails to even mention veins coming from the breasts in the anatomical excursus, which is why Galen ends up with this very decisive account of the vascular anatomy and how you link breasts and uterus. Um, I've spoken to doctors who say, in fact, there's not a vein <laughs> that's notably links the breast and the uterus, uh, and so it's all the more interesting that Galen is so intent to anatomically demonstrate this. So we're not going to be surprised by the fact that the Hippocratic text does not give an anatomical mapping, for the kinship or community of parts seems in the corpus not to requ require vascular pathways. But for, uh, for Galen, sympathy necessarily rests on anatomy. Elsewhere in his commentary on Epidemics too, he'll mock rivals who attribute sympathy to a vein that they saw in their dreams. For Galen, the network underlying sympathy is revealed then only through painstaking, expert, and repeated dissection. His exegesis of the text of Hippocrates is thus here, as in other places, a bringing to light of a subterranean web of Hippocratic sympathy. So for Galen, there is no kinship without flesh and blood bonds. <coughs> 
a world can only be made common through communicating vessels. Now, in his attempts to uncover that web, Galen is not entirely unfaithful to his source text. As we saw in On the Places in a Human Being, humoral pathology requires channels between places or parts of the body. So what's going to change between the Hippocratic text and Galen's networked body is a radical transformation of the very idea of a network in the body as the generic vessels of the early medical texts begin to ramify out into veins and arteries and nerves. Now the credit for differentiating veins and arteries is usually given to Prixagoras of Kos in the second half of the fourth century BCE. But this networked body, this kind of differentially networked body, really comes into its own in the third century BCE, where you have systematic human dissection at Ptolemaic Alexandria. So Herophilus will take over the distinction between veins and arteries from Praxagoras, but he'll also create an even more important distinction um, between veins and arteries on the one hand, which do the physiological work of the body, and nerves on the other hand, which participate in conscious, voluntary life. So it's the tripartite model, this veins, arteries, and nerves model, but also the differentiation between plant life and psychic life that Galen will inherit, refine, and elaborate from his Alexandrian predecessors. So one of the most important things about this differentially networked body is that it offers new resources for explaining life as a function of the organic body. So in early medical writing, breath and blood are indeed vital substances that move through the body. But with the Hellenistic networked body, these stuffs are folded into coordinated systems that together account for the basic functions of embodied and ensouled life. So on Galen's model, each system, so the venous, the arterial, and the nervous system, has an arche, which is not just a starting point, but a governing organ. So the veins will distribute nutrition, and they start in the liver. The heart distributes vital lifeblood, and start, or sorry, the arteries distribute vital lifeblood, and they start in the heart. And the brain, as he says, is like a sun, sending forth psychic pnea throughout the body by way of the nerves. Now, Galen will insistently assimilate his tripart model of the body to Plato's tripartite soul. And he will struggle quite hard at times to make sense of what is essentially a, a physiological system in terms of psychic functions. But what's important for our purposes is the way that the situation of different archai as the control centers of various networks doesn't just enable them to manage different functions of the body, that is to facilitate life. Rather, by virtue of their position at the heads of these networks, the various ruling parts are made vulnerable to disturbances and disruptions precisely through the phenomenon of sympathetic affection. This is, in fact, most true of the control center par excellence, the brain. In Galen, then, we will find a different take on the interimplication of mind and body that we have been tracking in the Hellenistic philosophers. So Galen's major text on, text on sympathetic affections is a text called On the Affected Parts, where the prevalence of sympathy is hardly surprising. For Galen takes it as given that a physician has to understand how a part of the body has been affected if he's going to administer the proper therapy. He therefore distinguishes in his opening remarks two different kinds of affections, those that come about because of damage to the part itself, that is idiopathy, and those that arise because of damage transmitted from one part to another along well-trafficked routes, that is sympathy. Now given its hegemonic status, we might expect that the brain would be a significant source of trouble for other parts of the body. And indeed, affections are sometimes communicated from the brain to elsewhere. So headaches, for example, can trigger gastric distress. Similarly, if the brain is corrupted by bilious humors, the eyes can be affected sympathetically through the transfer of smoky fumes along the optic nerves. And so this is how Galen under, uh, explains hallucinations. Yet in practice, damage travels most often in the other direction, that is, towards the brain. It's the transfer of noxious humors from the stomach to the brain that features as the paradigmatic example of sympathy in the opening section of On the Affected Parts, and that scenario will recur repeatedly in On the Affected Parts. So in one memorable episode, Galen describes a case of sympathetic epilepsy involving a student of literature. So Galen figures out that the problem is that the young man is too absorbed in his studies to eat. So graduate students, take, take heart, listen. So he cures him of the resulting epilepsy by enforcing regular mealtimes. 
So the trouble arrives most often for Galen along a path that connects the brain to the stomach and especially the mouth of the stomach, the cardia. The problem with the brain starts in the stomach. What makes the brain especially vulnerable is the presence of a large nerve that connects it to the opening of the stomach, what the modern anatomist would call the vagus nerve. The presence of the vagus nerve means that if the brain is like a sun emanating light throughout the body, it can also be eclipsed by smoky vapors rising from the gastric cavity to impair the functions of the mind. Now, in fact, it's well known that Galen held strongly to the view that the mind was vulnerable to disturbances of the body. He wrote a strongly polemical treatise, for example, arguing that the affections of the soul follow the mixtures of the body, and he encouraged philosophers who denied the dependence of the soul on the body to come to him for special regimens in order to improve their intelligence and thereby grasp the truth of the dependence of the soul on the body. But on the affected parts offers a different model of mutual affectability within the organism, one that is informed by this idea of networks and above all by the notion of sympathy. So rather than hammering home the mind's susceptibility to the vagaries of the humors, here Galen quietly but insistently circles the inversion of power between the brain and the rest of the body and especially between the brain and the gut. The gut plays such a prominent role in explaining apparently uh, mental diseases that it arguably begins to insinuate itself into the place of the liver in the proper version of Galen's tripartite, that is, platonic physio-psychology. So we might say that the problem of the appetites within this system is staged at the mouth of the stomach. That would mean to say that on the affected parts reworks the tension between the rational and the appetitive soul in Plato by repeatedly tracing a channel between the brain and the gut. But even if we don't accept that platonic resonance, it's clear that sympathy functions in the text as a site where the higher functions are made vulnerable to and disturbed by the lower functions. What's important to note is that the shared ground here is not generic corporeality, and it's not the unseen nebulous interpenetration of soul and body as it is for the Stoics and the Epicureans. Rather, for Galen, sympathy is enabled by a material conduit, a vagus nerve, the vagus nerve. The model is in one sense an elaboration of the Hippocratic body where generic vessels join up the parts into a holistic unity. But at the same time, I think you'd agree it's more complex. In Galen, the vessel, a nerve, becomes the occasion for the inversion of proper power relations in health by incorporating the hegemonic brain into a community dominated by the turbulent and toxic mouth of the gut and the processes of digestion. The very network that enables life and enables the brain to control the life of the body also is what makes the stomach its unruly neighbor. So does this mean that Galen develops a specifically medical version of the psychophysical sympathy that we see in the Hellenistic philosophers? And that question is more complicated than you might predict. For despite the fact that Galen readily implicates the brain in the affections of the stomach, he does not actually locate the soul in the sympathetic network that he describes. Nor does he recognize sympathy between the soul and its corporeal home, the brain. So I want to look at one passage in particular that draws out the contrast between Galen's enthusiastic endorsement of one kind of sympathy and his tacit rejection of another. And this will be number 11 on your window. So Galen has just described the sympathetic relationship between the diaphragm and the respiratory organs. He goes on to introduce, by way of analogy, the involvement in diseases of the ribs and lungs of what he calls the place containing the hegemonic principle of the soul in itself. Now, everyone knows, Galen says, that symptoms like delirium are not actually caused by the lungs directly. They all recognize, rather, that the part where the hegemonic principle of the soul is located, wherever that part may be, um, has suffered sympathetically with another part of the body. And Galen says, they try to show the manner of sympathy, ton tropon tes sympatheas, that agrees with their own doctrines. In other words, no one here is contesting the truth of sympathy. What they're contesting are the parts that are actually involved. But if this much is clear, things quickly become murky. So Galen goes on to wonder about shared affection between one part and uh, the archae or the soul, so the lungs in this case are the archae or the soul, and this is where the passage on the handout comes into play. 
So that the soul or the arche is damaged by changes to the body is, in Galen's eyes, an empirical and undeniable fact. By contrast, he says, it's very hard to know how the soul is harmed. So Galen sketches two prevalent philosophical views. So first, that the soul resides in the body as one resides in the house. And second, that the soul is some kind of form of the body, which he um, understands in, in quite materialist terms in another treatise. So it's a kind of materialist Aristotelianism. But although he implies that he finds it hard to reconcile the idea of the house as a, uh, sorry, the idea of the body as a mere house for the soul with the manifest damage that we see done to the soul by the body, he doesn't actually reject either of these positions out of hand. So Galen's unwillingness to come down hard on one side or the other is not unusual. So up until the end of his life, he was a professed agnostic about the soul, its immortality and its immateriality. If, as I suggested earlier, sympathy in a post-Hellenistic world entailed a commitment to the corporeality of the soul, it's not hard to see why Galen would be loath to talk about soul-body sympathy at the very moment he's describing the sympathy between the brain and the gut. For Galen, it's quite clear thought of sympathy as a technical concept premised on a network uh, beneath the skin that he had verified through dissection. Indeed, I suspect that it's precisely because Galen was so intimately acquainted with the inside of the body that he never speaks of the sympathy between the body and the soul. For the anatomist, psychophysical sympathy becomes a leap of faith. In the end, then, the soul will hover beyond the boundaries of Galen's sympathetically webbed organism, tethered by a line that he could map neither anatomically nor conceptually. In Galen, then, it would appear that the unity of body and soul is challenged by the figure of sympathy, even as sympathy implicates the brain in the gut. So mutual affectability here is both a bridge and a block in view of the difficulty of locating the soul in the physician's networked body. Now, in these last couple of minutes, I want to turn to ask from a really different angle how Galen handles the unity of the organism at the level not of the passive principle, mutual affectability, but in terms of what we might call the active principle, that is, the organism's organization around a common end. So last week, we saw how Galen used implicit notions of sympathy and antipathy to account for the vegetal body's capacity for generation growth and nutrition. And you might remember that the magnet here was the paradigmatic example for, the, uh, for attraction by quality, so the magnet very closely associated with sympathy. But then we saw that in the late text on my own opinions, Galen retreated from his use of the natural faculties, at least to explain the capacity of a, pan a plant to sustain its life. So he concluded there with Plato that plants must have a form of perception. So we might now want to ask, in light of that retreat, what do we want to say about the strange mindfulness of the vegetal, that is, the non-conscious physiological body for Galen? And I think we can answer this question by turning specifically to the question of generation. In On the Natural Faculties, Galen will attribute the sperm's capacity to shape life from matter to one of the natural faculties, so it's the dunamis diaplasticae. The shaping faculty is activated in the sperm when it comes into contact with female generative matter. And seamlessly, at this very moment, a sperm is transformed into some nature, physistis, that is the nature of the specific animal being generated. Now, the sperm can only affect this transformation if it attracts the right amount of blood to itself. So like Aristotle, Galen thinks that a seed flooded with menstrual blood will be destroyed. But how does it know how much blood it should attract? Obviously, Galen said the blood does not know how much of itself to contribute. But we also have to be careful not to attribute reason and intelligence, logismos and nous, to the, to the sperm. For that would be a category mistake. A sperm is not an animal. It's not a zoan. The solution that Galen comes up with in that text is a faculty for attracting blood that's just like the magnet's ability to attract iron. That is, of course, a form of sympathy, here extended to an attraction that can discern, qu discern quantity as much as quality. But the question becomes, can the same principle really explain both magnets and the generation of a human being? In the treatise on the formation of the fetus, Galen returns to the question of how human life is generated, and this time in a decidedly more apparatic mode. He there polemically rejects the claim that the hegemonic part of the animal is created first and then takes responsibility for the creation of the other parts. But the alternative, namely that it's the vegetal body that's the first to be generated, also will throw into relief the question of what kind of, of mind-like force drives 
embryonic generation or formation. And here Galen expresses genuine frustration. So everyone knows, he says, that there is a cause of the formation of the embryo. And moreover, everyone calls this nature, phusis, without knowing its substance, agnauntes autes tene vision. Now Galen is confident that you can't explain nature without a demiurge, and indeed he thinks the existence of the demiurge, like the soul, is compelled by, the, by a complex networked structure of her bodies. More generally, he rejects the claim which he associates with the Epicureans that the embryo can develop by a motion that is irrational and haphazard. But positing a demiurge actually creates new problems. So is the demiurge like an engineer of the automatons used in the theater? Does he or does his minion deities give the seeds of animals and plants a first push and then depart, leaving their organic wind-up toys to unfold their lives unaided? Now, Galen seriously considers this possibility, but he ends up rejecting it, too, on the grounds that the moisture of generative matter is incapable of faithfully conserving intelligent motions. So the fluidity that's so associated with the female just isn't going to be a trustworthy medium of demiurgic intelligence. So what then? And the problem is not just one of generation, Galen says. It has to do more broadly with the question of how any part of the non-conscious body knows how to do its work. This, he says, is the million dollar question which no philosopher has been able to answer satisfactorily. So one of Galen's favorite examples, he, come back, he comes back to it again and again, is the fact that even small children know how to move their limbs and articulate words without the slightest knowledge of how their bodies work. Some people might say that the muscles are animals. Galen thinks this is entirely implausible given the vast number of functions in the body. So he's not going to get away with answering the question of non-conscious mindfulness by making use of homunculi. And finally, Galen considers one last possibility. He says, perhaps there's just one soul that constructs us and continues to employ the parts, a claim that he relates to the broader philosophical claim that he associates with Plato, that soul is imminent in all of matter, so the idea of the world soul. And he's clearly attracted by this position. But what blocks him from accepting it is, in the end, an irreconcilable split within us between the vegetal body and the rational soul. For the problem, he says, is that the soul that manages us is ignorant of the parts that obey its urges. So the soul that manages us is ignorant of the parts that obey its urges. In other words, if a single soul pervaded the entire body, Galen thinks, then the workings of the body would be entirely transparent to our rational mind. But of course, they're not at all transparent to us. It's taken centuries of painstaking research to discover, discover the neural structures responsible for the actions that children and animals undertake unthinkingly, even at the moment of their birth. Indeed, the very inquiry into the nature of nature that I've been tracking in these last few minutes enacts our ignorance about the knowingness of our own bodies, of our organic being. So the explanatory impasse that Galen faces at the end of On the Formation of the Fetus is nothing less than a performance of the fundamental dividedness of human life. That impasse is a reminder that sympathy marks not only the joining of body and soul, but also the historical moment of their decisive separation a split not unlike the severing of the sexes in Aristophanes' famous fable. And that split will double the fold in nature that we talked about last week. So at the moment of conception, nature with a capital N gives way to unnature, fusus tis. But then whether at birth or if we follow the Stoics at the point you become a rational adult, some nature, this fusus tis, gives way to a rational mind. And the emergence of that mind marks a rupture between our vegetal, our animal being and our human being. So I've argued today that sympathy is from the very beginning, at least from the early medical texts, a way of generating a notion of the unified body. In the fourth century, it begins to work as a strategy for uh, joining together body and soul after their decisive separation in Plato and Aristotle, while nevertheless respecting the difference between them. It is a strategy, however, that runs into trouble at the hands of a master anatomist like Galen. More problematically still, even if sympathy could create a unity of body and soul or brain or gut in terms of mutual effectability, that is, in terms of the passive principle, it's much harder to create that unity on the terrain of the organism's orientation towards an end. For Galen, then, the problem is twofold. 
The body's complex and intricate structure may open the ruling parts to disturbances elsewhere in the body. It nevertheless manifests an incredible mindfulness. Yet he struggles to explain the relationship of rational mind to the mindfulness of this non-conscious body. And he struggles, too, to understand the relationship of that mindfulness to the demiurge. The name of the solution that he generates, but also the problem all over again, is once again nature, that which everyone points to in the generation of life, for example, but whose essence, whose usia, is a mystery. And moreover, if the name of nature is going to plug the gap between the demiurge and the vegetal body, it is also going to mark the distance between two sides of human nature, the work of organic life and the work of rational mind. Here, sympathy can build no bridges. So these questions will open up to a larger set of questions about the different ways in which human beings are implicated in a sympathetic web as minds and as bodies and as psychophysical compounds. These questions open, too, onto questions about what it means to entrust that web to the mindfulness of nature, physis or natura. In my final lecture next week, I want to step back and offer a more systematic defense of the claim I've been advancing, that sympathy is a locus for thinking about nature as a trans-individual principle in the post-classical period, as well as for thinking about the problems of folding that principle into individual beings. I'm going to consider further how the complexity of organicism haunts not just an understanding of cosmic sympathy, but the participation of humans in a larger non-human community. So if sympathy on a grand scale can read in terms of both vulnerability and total mastery, does the world it create equally polarize human nature as on the one hand riskily and vitally open-ended and on the other hand closed around a mind? Or are there other ways of meeting non-human nature as somehow equally embodied and equally ensouled? In short, sympathy, I'll suggest, is not just a problem of nature, but also a problem of human nature. Thank you. a good point because I think that so I would say two things I mean one is is that what I was trying to home in on was a little bit this problem of, of what a pathos actually is in the context of a soul and whether that language even makes sense to talk about in terms of a soul and so you know when he talks about the soul and the body being affected changing <coughs> sort of together there seems to be you know even if there's not this transmission you're talking about there's this hama there's this kind of joining that seems to take place. And it's, it's like, what is the term of commonality even in the face of their difference? And pathos might be one, but it has problems for its applicability to the notion of soul. So this idea of being changed together is more neutral, and he uses that. Um, but that's precisely why I think he doesn't use this notion <coughs> of, of sympathia, even though affectability for a body would be a pathos. So with that background, I mean, if in fact the reason he doesn't use sympathia, partly I think it's just the language isn't in circulation. Mm -hmm. 
But partly he does use it on one or two occasions, and the reason he's not using it for this connection between the body and the soul is because of, of this idea that there's not a pathos that's being communicated and the soul doesn't participate in, in pathe. But what's so, so interesting is that that moment in the prior analytics where he does use it, um, that somehow that there's a change in body and soul that the common ground is created by the notion of pathos. So that it's not just the commonality of simultaneity, which you get with the soon prefix or you get with comma, but, but what's, what else, you know? And, and the pathos comes in there. What's especially interesting to me is that in the peripatetic, these peripatetic texts, which are probably not by Aristotle, the physiognomy and the problemata, sympathy has become the term to talk about body and soul. And my suspicion here is that, I mean, Aristotelian homomorphism is a really hard thing to get your head around. It's super hard. And it's sort of much easier to think about something happening to one and then happening to the other. I mean, that's already happening in Plato when he's talking about the tremor that gets communicated, that there are somehow two places and one gets sent to the other. I mean, that's, as it were, a kind of more natural way to think about it. So what I think what you're seeing in those peripatetic texts is a kind of failure to grasp precisely the, the truth of the Aristotelian homomorphism, but sympathy sort of becomes the way that you talk about the common affectability and that the problem of the what is the nature of what's happening to the soul is there a something being you know moved between them is just kind of falling away and it's becoming the sort of central term but then it's really you know I like you know obviously I like Christoph Rapp's argument that you know with the parapatetics might be doing it sort of you know unconsciously or you know this has just become the language to talk about that commonality I like the idea that they're actually sort of polemically taking up this in order to claim the pathos as the, as proving the corporeality of, of the soul. So, so you're right. Um, you're very much right that you, you shouldn't talk that way. And yet I see kind of Aristotle at the beginning, at this moment in the tradition where that's becoming a way to think about perception. It's becoming a way to think of the implication of soul and body in each other. And he's both using it and resisting it. And his resistance fails. Uh, let's first then. Um, yeah, I think you uh, provide a very interesting light on the unity um, of the other body, the unity between body and soul. The unity um, you're showing, I mean, it has to do a lot with um, sympathetic affection, the body affecting the, the soul, the mind, and the soul the mind affecting the body. But I can't, uh, maybe it's just going to be old fashioned, but I can't. Uh, <laughs> You're absolutely right, and that, and I stress that less for reasons much like in the first lecture, I focused more on vulnerability and, and openness, but, but there are different reasons here too, and there are kind of two ways I would answer that. One is, is that in the Stoics and in the Epicureans, it is true that sympathy ultimately becomes one of the mechanisms for thinking precisely of how this 
down, top-down hegemonic control of the body is affected by the soul. And so sympathy is about how sensation is sort of moved from the body up to the soul so the soul can sort of navigate its surroundings, but also voluntary motion. And that comes out clearly in the Lucretius bit, um, probably most clearly in Lucretius, but also in the Epicurean um, examples. Uh, not so much in those stoic examples of mutual affectability, but you're absolutely right that the kind of interimplication that allows for the communication of affection is also what is, what is allowing for life. And, and, and that's really important to stress, and I don't want to deny that at all. I mean, part of my point about sympathy is that both sides are there. It's both the vulnerability and the kind of distributed you know, vulnerability that I've been talking about that endangers the hegemonicon. And at the same time, it's this network that allows the hegemonicon to... Um, control the body and then in the Hippocratic on nutriment you get this sense of this kind of this con this unified body is more unified not so much by the rational mind sending control signals but by a kind of vegetal life like I'm talking about in Galen but the point that I want to make is much like in that first lecture something about the language of sympathia because the notion of pathos is not neutral even as Aristotle tries to recuperate the notion of sensation there's something problematic about pathos that this notion of of vulnerability and suffering is sort of built in so that when you talk about the fact that the soul is a body, you're going to talk about the fact not that it actually can act on the body, but the fact that it suffers with the body suffers. So there's something about being material that's linked to the vulnerability. So I don't, I don't at all want to deny that, that I think there is a symmetry. And the symmetry is crucial to my notion of doubleness, but that the very language of sympathy actually sort of tends toward the other. The other thing I would say is Galen is a different case. So in the, the unaffected parts, it's a, it's a text about pathology. Um, but, and Galen is, is you know, mostly interested in cases where things are going wrong. So there's, this is a different context. And there the asymmetry is very dramatic, precisely because of that pathological context. But what's especially interesting, I think, in Galen is that the asymmetry whereby, what you're talking about, whereby actually the body influences the soul more is in a sense given, I think, by the very way in which the, in the Platonic model, there's also an asymmetry. You know, that in the, the, it's not that the parts are kind of all balanced, the three parts, but rather they're only balanced if the logisticon is controlling the rest. And so in Galen, as it were, that kind of in, in, in symmetry is, is inverted. It's not just that the soul suffers with the body and the body suffers with the soul. It's like the whole system has been turned upside down. The brain, which is supposed to send down sun, is now occluded by these vapors. So part of it is the pathological context, and I think you really can't deny that. I mean, um, there's a bit at the beginning of prognosis where Galen also acknowledges that the um, body is affected by the affections of the soul. And what he's talking about is um, evidence in the pulse of, of erotic des desire. So there's the case of a woman who's in love with a, a acrobat or something, or a dancer. She's hiding it. And Galen detects this from the pulse, but he's very quick to say there's no erotic pulse. It's not, there's no pulse that's tied to eros. Rather, the affections of the soul are registered in the body. So he perfectly acknowledges that, but it's like really one of the only times I found it in his treatise. Most of the time he's interested in how the body impacts the soul, how the gut impacts the soul. And that's because he's a doctor and his power is manipulating the body. Um, so, so I think you have to take those cases apart from one another, but I think actually on both sides there's a kind of pull towards magnified vulnerability through the, through the figure of, of sympathy. I would just, and, and you meant They don't say the finger is cut, and then the mind intervenes and decides to assent whether. I mean, you know, there's a, there are situations where they want to emphasize unity, and that unity really is established in mutual effectiveness. But I would say, you know, before that, there's the unity which consists of the mind, the telling, 
right that both aspects are there and that and so not to go on and on but I mean the first lecture that idea that sympathy is yeah. also about the most totalitarian top-down control is absolutely part of my story I don't want to lose that it's this both and that's the doubleness of organicism yeah I just wanted to first offer maybe a, a different text from Aristotle that sort of shows that the problem is already in him and not just the later parapetic misunderstanding of how markers and so at the end of the on memory and recollection, there's this little coda after he's given the account of recollection he talks about the um, the ways in which certain kinds of physical constitution are related to people's power to recollect and the way that the man can interfere. This really striking analogy where he, he says it's just like anger where the motion in the body around the, the heart, presumably, continues going. And even when people try to set up counter motions, um, when they try to stop, force themselves not to be angry, the original motions continue. And so I think that the idea of the, the sort of psychophysical affection, sort of how I think it's conflict between the, the body and the, yeah. the mind, it's sort of it's already there. I think it's all over the part of Australia where he's really working with the psychophysical theory of the animal one. And, Somehow, it doesn't seem like the, the high market solution and the animal two, one solves all those problems yeah. instantly. It's, it's a problem for him. Um, but just in general, I was interested in your claim that in the fourth century, the sort of body soul co affection is one of the issues. And I just want to ask about another aspect of that, which is in um, what are the, the possibilities for, for purely psychic activity? That seems to be an important part of the story. Both in Plato and Aristotle. You mentioned the Philebus, I was thinking of the Keto, where um, all the affections uh, we think of as psychic, like pleasure and pain, are lumped in on the side of things that the body sort of um, infects the soul with, and there's this aspiration to find something um, that the soul can do itself by itself, namely intellect the forms. And then again, this kind of tension, but it's not really spelled out very clearly. And then you get the same tension in the Dan of three. Where you know it, we get this picture of intellect as the one thing that doesn't have a bodily organ, which is very surprising given the theory of soul at the end too. But then at the end, we get this concession in chapter ten or eleven that yes, even thinking requires phantasms to have um, the psychic correlates. Again, it's drawn back to the body. Um, and what happens, it seems, with the Stoics is that that um, that line of thinking takes prominence. Maybe this is in the Hellenistic schools generally that. There's a kind of affectability component to thinking itself. Um, so uh, the impressions are required. It's not like we're, you know, there's a whole problem with stuff about rational impressions and what those are. But at least like the, the center of the story seems to be about how our thinking is bound up with our affectability as well. Um, and that's sort of that's one way of resolving this um, this kind of tension, this aspiration to find a pure psychic activity is that. No, even when you thought of it as the most psychic thing, um, itself is bound up in infectability. Yeah. And, and they never be disentangled. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's right. No, thank you. I mean, I think your your comments about Aristotle, I think, bring out an important point that as long as they, this hama, or even a kind of, if we take the notion of soon as chrono, you know, simultaneous temporally, we, we are able to sort of sidestep the question of transfer, what, what you know, kind of movement across. But in the example you're giving from the Parva Naturalia, there's really a sense of um, a primary spot where the affection is taking place and is then being communicated to, you know, or driving what's expressed on the other side. So I think that distinction is an important one. I mean, on whether, you know, how much this endangers the account in the Dhyanam, I mean, in that article I cited by Stephen Men, he wants to see a kind of developmentalist approach. Other people would say, look, Aristotle's just going to give different accounts depending on whether he's focused on, you know, the soul down or kind of body up. Um, and, but I think you're right. I think that there's this kind of tension there from the beginning. And it comes again from this fact that it's really hard to think homomorphism in any, any robust sense, especially when you're talking about suffering. So the interesting thing about the disembodied mind, I mean, I think that's a really good point because um, like in, well, two things I would say. So in the Phaedo, you specifically get this idea of trying to unchain the soul from the body. So, you know, it's much like, the, it's a kind of anticipation of what you see in the Phaedo, where the goal is to sort of, okay, if you can't unchain your, your body from the soul, then the, be the next best thing is anesthesia, where you could take the, and the sensations will be weak enough, they'll never sort of surface, as it were. Um, but it's, you know, assumes that, 
again, you could isolate out, out the soul even, even in life. And I think what you're seeing in um, Aristotle as sensation becomes sort of depathologized, I mean, with these traces that we're talking about, but where there's really a sense in which sensation is part of life and it's a, it's a kind of um, physiological thing is coincident with things going on in the fourth century in medical thinking as well about really moving away from thinking about um, just the body as a site of pathology, but really thinking about what is physiological function and how, what kinds of organisms do you need for that. And as that gets developed, I mean, what I'm describing in the Hellenistic schools is of, of a piece with that and probably influencing the way that Pneuma works, for example, in, in Stoic sympathy, that there's really a lot of work going into what are these structures of imagining the marriage of body and soul not as a thing to be avoided, um, but as something that is a necessary part of understanding a human being so that that organicism that I'm talking about that I see is really implicated in larger questions of sympathy and questions of nature really does come into being in the fourth century as a problem in a way that in the Phaedo it's, it's just not the same problem. I mean, I don't think there are not antecedents of the problems I'm thinking about in Plato, but on that count, no. But that idea, the, the, the wish to be able to not, to, to unyoke soul and body of course persists, and I'm thinking, I mean, it's the last thing I'll say, I'm thinking that, you know, in Lucretius's example of consensus, the first point he makes is actually that the, um, uh, the animus can withdraw from the anima, because it's really important for, for ethic, as much as for Stoic and the notion of assent, for the, for the Epicureans too, you don't actually want to be totally open to the world. I mean, not, absolutely not. I mean, this, you know, this idea that somehow they're just crazy materialists misses the point that like, it's the very fact that the world is you know, wildly materialist and indifferent to your happiness, that you have to be able to separate out from the, local, from the site where you're implicated in those things. So that Lucretius first establishes the separability before he then goes on to establish the implication of anima and animus in terms of, of consensus, and then the implication of the body or the compound in relationship to anima and animus. So I've always found that incredibly interesting. So can, I, can I just follow up with a question in that regard, I think? Um, it's about Galen. And I think he said at one point that, I mean, the more networked the body becomes, Right, the harder it then is to add back soul into the picture. And I, I guess I was wondering, like, I mean, is that a, a, just a practical fact, you know, that, that you know, just sort of Galen just becomes sort of absorbed in, in, you know, doing his work and, you know, he's not thinking about that? Or, or, is, it, or is it a theoretical problem? Yeah. Uh, it's both. I mean, and I think the claim would be it's both the more networked the body becomes, but also um, the more he is able to see it and handle it, that the, the dissection and practice of dissection has a kind of role okay. in thinking about um, where you're going to put this soul, you know, where are you going to locate it. And so he's got this, you know, he has a really strong sense theoretically of the kinds of questions that will respond to the empirical investigations that he's undertaking. And then he has the kinds of questions that don't respond to the methods that he's so practiced in in establishing truth. And those kinds of questions concern the nature of soul, whether it's immortal, whether it's immaterial. You know, he, he recognizes that somehow the, that question just doesn't, doesn't respond. And because he has a theoretical distinction, his materialism and his notion of the corporeality of soul looks so different from the Stoics. Like the Stoics, you know, how they could persist in thinking that the heart is the center of the, of, you know, the hegemonicon. Well, it has to do with the fact that they really privilege phenomenological you know, evidence. So that if I, where does voice come from? Where do I feel my, they're not looking at Galen there in the forum demonstrating with pig's brains and goats or whatever that you actually can ligate uh, the vocal nerve and it's the brain is the hegemonicon. They're just re removing that realm of that okay. kind of evidentiary okay. realm. But for Galen, you know, you go beneath the skin and you can no longer sort of treat questions of corporeality, you know, materiality, it's all sort of corporeal in terms, in the same kinds of way that the so Stoics do. So is it, it's the fact of there being sort of distinct, I mean, net, distinct networked systems, I mean, that are distinct from one another, that is the problem? And I think it's the specificity, the fact that like, there's so much there and he can understand the functioning of the body through this really feedback of ligating yeah. and figuring out what function is and seeing, you know, feeling, touching. Uh -huh. I mean, I've struggled to, to try to express this, but like, you know, why, why can't he? See, it's really interesting, the very moment that he's all over sympathy and the sympathy between yeah. the brain and the gut, he will not. Yeah. He goes into this weird aside about how nobody knows what the link is between somebody. He's got yeah. to know. 
right. about the right. philosophical right. tradition of sympathia. Right. And I mean, Alexander and of Aphrodisias in the second century is trying to give an Aristotelian account of sympathia that does not require corporeality, which yeah. I think is further evidence that he knows, that Galen knows that to talk about sympathia between soul and body is a commitment to corporeality. Yeah. But his corporeality is a different kind of corporeality yeah. that's established through the visual yeah. and not just through phenomenological experience or even just recognizing that one thing, you know, obviously if I get drunk, it affects me. He's willing to accept that, but he wants to see the connection. Yeah. That anatomy yeah. is the ground of truth, and you can see that in, in the way, in the commentary on epidemics too. He's just obsessed with finding the anatomical substratum of the claims that are being made by, by Hippocrates. That Hippocrates right. becomes the kind of, these textual clues are also symptoms of reality that is submerged and can be seen. Right, and, and that consists of, of sort of non-communicating physiological yeah, systems so in the that just yeah. back, you know, just chest, I mean, breast, genitals, voice, yeah, and, right, 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 yeah. and a kind of yeah. disregard for how they might be connected. I mean, yeah. there is actually evidence that the Hippocratic thought yeah. there was a vessel running along that, but they, they don't feel the need to prove it in those yeah. terms. Whereas by the time you get to Galen, if you can't prove it, it's not that it doesn't exist, but it's a problem. Like there's an example where he talks about this sympathy between the spleen and the shoulder in a certain affection, and this is where he says these people see this vein in their dream. And the problem is, is that he says sympathy is given, and he says you have to admit it, and he actually uses the magnet. He says the same way if someone, if you see the power of the magnet, you have to believe it. But if someone just told you about the power of the magnet and they didn't have an explanation, they wouldn't believe it. And it's the same type of thing. We see the, the sympathy between this symptom and this symptom that are at a distance. Mm. We don't know how yeah. to explain right. it. Right, right, right. Uh, because he can't find the vein that links them. It's a huge problem for him in a way that, I mean, the Hippocratic text is just not. And for the Stoics, they're just not. I mean, they've got this totally other way of talking yeah. about soul permeating body. Yeah. It's not yeah. requiring an anatomical substratum. Yeah. And I think all of that is contributing to his kind of angst about an ethereal, ephemeral, immaterial, invisible soul. He just doesn't know where it goes. Yeah. You'd think he could give it to Pneuma, but he has like a problem with that. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Other questions for work? All right. Um.